Want to win more matches on big commercial venues? Then there's two key methods you need in your armory, and that is what we're running through today. Oh, look at that, straight away. Feels like a proper carp. Look at him. Whoa. I reckon we're in for a good day here, you know. We're at Lindo and we're on the Loco Lake. It's big, open water, full of big F1s, full of big carp, perfect for fishing. The bomb and the pellet waggler methods that are great, not only for winning matches with big weights of fish, but for catching some big special fish as well. If you've not done any big lake rod and line fishing for carp, make sure you get out there and have a little tickle on it. I can promise you, you'll absolutely love it. It's always the bomb to start with on this kind of venue for me, mainly because at the start of a session, I'm expecting the fish to still be on the bottom. The first few feeds that go in, they're likely to follow it down. And the other reason is before I want to catch the fish up in the water on a waggler, I need to create some competition. And that normally takes a little bit of time, firing some pellets in consistently, the same place, nice and regular. And if the fish do want to be up, you can read that by using the bomb. If you're getting indications and liners are not catching, then perhaps they're a little bit higher up. So for me, the start of the session is always kicking off on the bomb. Another carp just come up there, look, just past where I'm fishing. I just feel like it's a good opportunity to maybe nick an early big fish or two. And obviously, if you pleasure fishing, that's great. But in a match, even better, because if you can get ahead with a couple of big carp, fantastic. Now, accuracy is everything with a bomb. You need to almost think pole and fish the bomb. And by that, I mean, I want my bomb landing right in amongst the feed. Pinging pellets is a great method on the pole, but it's all about accuracy. And it's exactly the same, even 25 metres out into a big lake like this. So I generally try and fire two or three lots of pellets in and then cast me bomb as close to them as possible, if anything, just on the back edge of them. And the reason for that is it's quite deep here, sort of 12 foot where I'm fishing. And I want my bomb just to swing back into the back edge of where them pellets are landing. And then, then the next thing is I'm going to get my line down out of the way of the wind. I've got an 8 mil pellet on the hook, and that's right in amongst that loose fit. I've just had a line straight away, which is great. Already shows signs that there's fish in that first lot of pellets. Could have been an F1 or something closer in, don't know yet. But in this deep water, just pay a little bit of attention and get everything set nice. And I'm just going to start to steadily build up the swim. I don't want to go lashing in half a pouch of pellets everywhere this early on. It'll probably be an hour, hour and a half, two hours before I even think about really upping it. First part of a session on lakes like this generally is a little bit steadier. And if you, oh, look at that, straight away. I was just about to say, if you can take it a little bit steady to begin with, you've not got loads and loads of bait in your peg, and therefore, if there, are, there is an odd fish kicking about early on, they're more likely to pick out your up bait. Just like that one, that had probably been in there for, I'm saying, a minute or so. And clearly, them few fish that are in the area have followed down them first few eight mils, and that's the reason for starting on the bomb. Often, if there's a few hung up in the water, you'll feed them few pellets, and the first few fish there will just follow them down. Feels like a proper carp, this one. Got a nice soft rod. I don't know if you saw that bite there, but it absolutely ragged it round. The beauty of a nice through action rod, it's a 10 foot Steve Ringer to be honest, is almost acts like elastic. You can pull nice and hard and aggressive, but there's not that much pressure on the fish, just absorbs all the head nods. Eight mil pellet on the hook. I've just got my clutch set so that sort of when the rod bottoms out, my clutch will start to give a little bit of line. Feels like a decent fish to start with. But this is the perfect example of that early start. Not hammering in, you know, 10 big pouchfuls of pellets to begin with. Just being accurate, feeding five or six times with four or five and then putting the bomb right in amongst them, cast just past so it swings back in right on them. A little bit like if you were starting on a pole, you'd probably have a pole pot on, 
rattle in 15 or 20 pellets and set a little trap. I'm trying to achieve that in this early part of the session on the bomb. Good fish this is, boys and girls. As you can see, that soft rod just sort of absorbs all them lunges, head bangs. You can keep a lot of pressure on fish without them sort of panicking and dashing off. I'd much rather use a softer rod, even for big carp. I feel like it's a little bit like having a nice soft elastic in your pole in the sense that they don't tend to panic as much. You don't tend to get anywhere near as many hook pulls. If you need to fish a little bit of a smaller hook and light a line on a hard day, you can without worry of getting broke. And being realistic, I mean, this fish could be double figures. You don't need to catch them ridiculously fast to build up a weight. It's a lovely fish. Big common, I think, that is. This is probably... Look at him. Oh, I've got to get him in there. I don't know if camera boy's got that or not, but what a start on that is the beauty of seeing them odd fish topping out there, starting on the bomb, just getting that initial little bit of feed right to get an early bite off exactly what we came for. Great big loco lump. When you've got a lot of open water in front of you, like we have here at Loco on Lindown today, the scope to actually fish two different spots. And a lot of people don't think about that when they're bomb fishing, but if it was a pole match, you'd happily have a shorter line and a longer line. And that's exactly the way I go about approaching this kind of venue. I fish a little bit closer, sort of just past the pole line, 14, 16 meters. And there I feed six mil pellets with the intention of catching a few more smaller fish, some F1 smaller carp, and when them big ones want to rock up there, you can really hammer the bait in and they'll come. But then further out, I give myself the chance of doing something a little bit different. And there, I'll ping some 8 mil pellets. I'll be looking to pick off an odd really big carp that's just sat back in the middle of the lake. What a start. Honestly, didn't expect one that quick, but proper fish, probably not quite double figures. Maybe somewhere between 8 and 9 pound, but... Perfect example of a bit of watercraft, seen a few out in the lake, started on the long line, not too much feed, nice and accurate. I reckon we're in for a good day here, you know. Be nice to get a few on a waggler, wouldn't it? Don't always get a plan like that, gang, I'm not going to lie, but definitely shows that picking the right line to start and feeding right gets you them early bites. And I'm going to literally repeat the same before I cast back out because I've got a feeling if we've had one, there might be a few more out there. So concentrating again to get these nice and accurate, I'm going to feed three lots of sort of six, eight mil pellets. That's confusing, isn't it? Six, eight mil pellets, make it four lots because one of them went a bit wayward. If you do have a, a feed that veers off, just make sure that you don't get lazy and leave it and, and feed again, very, very important. Simple eight mil fishery pellet in a band. That's what we had that one on. And I've actually started off, I've got a 16 Super MWG on. I've got my six inch up length, but I've set my stop at 15 inches to start with. That's just sort of middle of the road. If I feel like I'm getting mugged off, I'll move it closer. And if I feel like I'm missing out on fish, I'll move it further away. But then just for my accuracy, I'm gonna feed again a couple of times and then follow it in with the bomb, just like last time. But that first one then didn't go quite where I wanted it, so I'm going to feed again, and I'm going to put this just on the back edge of them pellets, like so. Just got everything nice and tight and set. I think it's important to do that, spend a few seconds making sure everything's um, locked up nicely, just because I want to be seeing any liners that I'm getting. And if you've got a bow in your line or a pretty slack tip in this wind, you don't actually see indications. And it is very, very important that you do, because obviously if I'm getting a lot of indications and not catching, I need to change something. And then I'm not going to forget that close line feed a little bit more aggressively there sort of a dozen six mils twice it's just worth having a little bit of patience with this kind of approach you catch a couple of three of them an hour and a few f1s you're on for a ridiculous weight 
It's very easy with this kind of fishing to feel like you're sat doing nothing. But if you're doing a little bit of monitoring of your bites and you're concentrating, you've just got to be realistic about how many you've got to catch if you're sort of aiming for a big weight. It's not that many. Bomb-wise, I keep it simple. 99% of the time, I'll use a two-thirds of an ounce bomb, and I feel like that's a lovely balance of heavy enough to be nice and accurate. On a big lake, you're often tasked with tricky conditions, so you need to be able to cast that bomb right in amongst your feed, and a slightly heavier one, three-quarters of an ounce, is heavy enough to do that without being big, cumbersome, and making loads and loads of noise. If I were fishing really close, in really calm conditions, I might have a little tiny one-thirds of an ounce, but 99% of the time it's two-thirds of an ounce and in really tricky conditions, fishing a long way out, I might step up to an ounce, but I've got to be honest, two-thirds of an ounce does pretty much everything for me. So, a couple of minutes gone by there, no indications. I'm just going to feed again and see if I get any response from a little bit of bait going in. Three times, five or six, eight mil pellets. Not negative, but four times. That one weren't great. Tricky today. I'm having to sort of compensate for the wind, fire them a little bit left, and straight away, an indication there as them pellets have landed. So that's telling me maybe there's an odd fish up. Don't forget that short line. Still feel like it's far too early to actually go on the waggler, but what that does tell me is that first fish that we had was a very, very quick bite, less than a minute. And this has been in now for, what, three or four minutes, and the only indication that I've had is actually when I've fed bait. So already I'm thinking I'm gonna wind this in and I'm gonna reset it. The one bite that we've had came quick. I'm getting indications as my bait's hit in the water, so I feel like the fish are probably gonna be following it down. So I'm just gonna reset. Feed some pellets and cast back into them. I've got a feeling today there's fish moving about a lot. I've seen a lot of fish topping, boshing out, in and around where I'm fishing. I feel like it's going to be a bit of a quick bite sort of day, to be honest. Generally fine. When fish are moving about a lot, it's warm, it's windy, that that's more of a... Um, casting more regular, feeding regular and sort of making it happen kind of day. When it's flat calm or a bit cooler and cold, generally they're the days you want to be a little bit more patient. Straight away indication there, again, there's definitely a few fish in the area. One thing that I would say is, if I have a... Oh, that one's on. I was just about to say, if I do have a cast and don't actually get any indications or hook a fish. I like to change something in the sense of lengthen the hook length, shorten the hook length, just so that I'm always building towards actually learning something or making something happen. That bite then, I weren't far off reeling that in, to be honest with you. Probably been in for about five minutes, um, but I'd had an odd little indication and there's an odd fish moving about for sure. Feels like another proper carp though. So again, early on, I'm thinking, this is a great start. I'm not gonna overdo it with bait just yet. The nice thing about starting in this sort of steady manner in terms of feeding is that you can always up it to make something happen. Whereas if you go guns blazing on a bomb straight away, hammering baiting, you've sort of one methoded it straight away. Whereas the beauty of this is, I'm, I feel like at the minute I'm catching the early fish that are in my peg. And once I've got these out of the way, I can then change things up to catch others afterwards. Feels like another really good fish. I've got eight pound Pulse Pro mainline on today. It's bulletproof stuff, it really is. And what I like about it is it's not only very, very strong, it sinks brilliantly well. And I feel like that's very important when you're fishing any rod and line on the bottom, bomb, feeder, hybrid, whatever. And the reason is you want to get that rod set as quickly as possible. So if all your line's tight and sank, you can start reading any liners or indications straight away. 
If your line's floating too much and bowing round, you, you've not got the ability to be reading what's happening while it's all sinking and straightening up. Another nice fish. There we go, another cracker. The actual setup for the bomb that I use is all about versatility and different days you'll find different length hook lengths or different drops below the bomb in between the bomb and the hook bay sort of work. Sometimes a, a big long three foot hook length will work an absolute treat and other days you want a little tiny sort of six or eight inch hook length so there's a bit more of a bolt effect and it actually pays to play around with that during the session and my setup itself is incredibly simple but allows me to be super versatile it's a bomb in line one straight on the line a large super tight line stop on there and then a loop tied in the eight pound pulse pro main line and on the bottom of that i just attach a six inch hook length and then by moving the super tight line stop further away or closer in a matter of seconds i can change the length of the drop below the bomb if i want to bolt it up a little bit and be a bit more direct i can slide it right down and have a six inch up length if I then feel the fish are watching the bait fall in, I want a bit of a slower fall, bigger separation between the bomb and the up bait, I can slide it up three, four foot, whatever you possibly want. But that really simple setup is incredibly versatile and I play around with it a lot during the day, depending what's happening in the peg. The only other thing I wanted to touch on, you might have noticed when I cast in and when the bombs hit the bottom I get tight to it and I also give it a little pull and straighten it out so I'll just show you I'll just show you this time I'm just going to cast this right in amongst the last few pellets that I fed so that bomb's sinking now and there it's just hit the bottom and what I'm going to do I tighten up pretty quick as I can that important that eight pound and then I just give it a pull of about I don't know, 18 inches, two feet. And what I feel like that does is it straightens out the hook length from the bomb. And it's important to do it straight away because something that we found on underwater when we've been filming that I've sort of applied to this kind of fishing is if your hook length's nice and straight kicked out on the bottom, when a fish picks it up, it's a lot harder for it to get away with it and reject the hook bait even bream fishing at ferry meadows um even on the first underwater we did on a hybrid no matter how long the hook length is as long as it's out straight when a fish picks it up there's a lot more chance of it feeling the resistance hook penetrating and you get a fish on and you can actually do that yourself as soon as that bomb's landed and you tie give it a little nudge especially on these big open lakes where the bottom's nice and flat and most of the time nice and clean and it just straightens everything out so you're in the optimum position for one picking it up and actually getting hooked not gonna feed too much while my bomb's in then last two casts when i actually fed on top of the bomb i had indications and didn't get one that last cast when i've just caught one i fed some bait cast right on top of it left it and it was sort of four minutes and I got one on. I feel like at the minute, if I start firing baiting on top of the lead, it's likely to get the fish moving, looking up in the water and not quite following it down. So I'm just gonna have a couple of casts now and try and get another one by feeding, casting in it, been a little bit patient. I've had two indications already this cast, so there's definitely fish grubbing about. And I'm pretty sure that they're on the bottom because I haven't fired any pellets in. The only thing that I will do is feed a few six mils closer on that close line for later. I mean, this would be the perfect scenario here would be to nick these few carp early, maybe nick a few on a pellet waggler, and by the time this starts to slow down, because we've got to be realistic, you can't catch an eight or 10 pound carp every single chuck. By the time this does start to slow, hopefully we'll have gathered some fish closer in we can move on to that close line and keep catching. Like I've mentioned before, always feel like making a little change, almost cast to cast, is good on this kind of thing, whether it's tweaking how long your drop between your bomb and your pellet is, your hook length length sort of thing, or if you're on a waggler, 
tweaking the depth until you start to actually find a pattern. For me, it's just about getting them odd little runs of fish. Caught a couple of real good ones already. You don't need many little spells of catching fish that sort of size to build a massive weight. So them little changes to nick another couple, definitely worth doing all the time. And it also keeps me fishing. It keeps me in tune with it, which I think is really important. If you just sat not doing anything, it's very easy to get lazy, not make the right decisions by having sort of rigs that you can tweak regularly and being active in doing that. It just keeps you alert and on it all the time. There's a lot of sort of watercraft style signs that tell you where fish are and what they're doing. And being good at this kind of fishing is all about being able to read them. Obvious ones, fish putting their heads out, fish topping, especially big carp on particular days when they want to be up. You'll see them poking their heads out of the water, especially amongst your eight mil pellets. And if you're seeing that happening and there's fish in and around your feed, you've got to be on it and trying it because as I've mentioned before, a little spell of catching three or four or five six, eight, ten pound carp is a massive chunk of weight in the net. Um, but by the same token, there's lots of signs you can read under the water and aside from it as well. Line bites and indications on a bomb are absolutely massive. And if you're getting lots of indications but not actually catching fish, you've got to make some moves and try and pinpoint fish to your hook bait. And that's where things like casting around your feed can be effective. Length and in the length of your hook length to get a little bit of a slower fall so one picks it out or even coming up and fishing the waggler on top of it. For example, you're getting loads of signs on the bomb underneath your eight mils and you're hammering your six mils in close in and you're getting a lot of indications. There's probably fish on your six mils giving you liners. So just be aware and alert all the time. Look at the signs and if you're getting signs and not catching, that's when you've got to make some changes. The reason that I'm not sort of dashing to get out on that waggler as yet is because the two fish that I've caught have been real good ones. And if I managed to nick another one of them on this, it'd be an amazing start to the day, especially if it was a match. So all I'm doing is I'm keeping feeding so that when I do go on that waggler, hopefully there's some there, they're gathered, they're competing. And when I do go on it, the little bit of time and patience I've had trying to nick another one on this even if i don't get that fish i should make up for it by getting a couple straight away when i go on the waggler so keeping that short line fed with them six mils but before i go on it i'm going to give this waggler a go out there and try and nick a couple more big carp on that just up the regularity pretty sure after this cast i'm going to go on it and when you do switch to a waggler, a bit more regular feeding definitely seems to hold them up in the water a bit more. A bit more noise, bait falling a little bit more often. You'll just gather them and keep them in the upper layer. So I'm gonna just up the regularity of these next couple of minutes and then pick up that waggler and try and nick one on it. Although a lot of people might think you can't fish a waggler in a crosswind like this, it can be a really good method for just nicking an odd fish on days like this, especially big carp. And getting them timings right and knowing when to make the change between the bomb and the waggler is really, really important. For me, on big lakes and on days like this, it's not about simply loose feeding pellets and once the fish are up in the water, that's it. You're just fishing the waggler shallow. It's all about getting little runs of fish on this kind of venue. Starting on the bomb, catching what's there. And if you feel like there's a few coming up, get on that waggler you might stay on it for the rest of the session you might catch two or three or even just one fish and then have to come back off it and you can play the two methods the up and on the waggler and the down on the bomb off against each other really well making changes and picking off them runs of fish i'm gonna start about three and a half feet deep i got that set just because you're fishing that little bit deeper don't necessarily mean that you've got to catch them at that depth. Often they'll eat the bait just as it lands. I feel like on these big lakes, you're often better fishing a little bit deeper and catching them as the pellet lands. And just like the bomb, I'm gonna feed before I cast out. It's gonna be tricky in this wind, 
my aim is to sort of punch it out there and get the line low and down as quickly as I possibly can. So like the line's low and down straight away. I've got everything as tight as possible. And on this, as soon as your float starts to skip around, I think your chance of a bite is gone. So you've got to be quite active. I'm just going to change where my rod rest is so I can rest it a little bit better to feed. Sort of like the rod across me and at a slight angle on this. Looking at how aggressively that float sort of moved round out of the way, might even need to start sinking the line a little bit, leave the pellet hanging there. Just see if I can get an early bite in and amongst the feed. A lot of movement on it. Started on a little foam waggler, so it's not as noisy, but it's moving quite a lot. I'm just going to change already there. I can tell that foam waggler, it's just not heavy enough to hold in the wind. So I'm going to go extreme straight away and put a bigger 10 gram balsa on. Fishing a pellet waggler in a crosswind, quite a strong one like we've got today, it can be tricky, but there's a few little things that'll really help you out. The first one's picking the right float. You want as light a float as you can because you'll miss less bites on it and it makes a little bit less noise, but it's got to be able to get to the distance and it's got to sit stable out there for as long as it possibly can. So as light a float as you can get away with that will do the stability things that you need it to do and get to the distance you need it to get to balsa just sits a little bit more sure in that wind. I can cast it well out, get that line sank, bring it back into my feed and I'll just spend more time actually in the catching zone by using that float. You can see already that's sat a lot more stable. The other thing is casting. You need to be able to cast it in and get your line down and straight as quick as possible. And practicing and learning how to cast, stop the waggler so everything lands straight, but then dropping the rod at the same time to get that line tight, straight and low down is really important. And I think another little thing that people tend not to do, but can work really well on big lakes is actually sinking the line on the waggler, casting it past the feed, sinking the line like you would on a traditional waggler and actually leaving a pellet suspended and hanging in the water. On these deep lakes, a suspended pellet just sat there for some reason can be very, very good. And sometimes you'll sit there for a minute, minute and a half, two minutes with it sat suspended, static in the water, pinging an odd pellet over it and you get a bite out of the blue. And often, that's from some of the biggest fish. And if you actually think about how some of the specimen carp boys fish with a zig rig, it's a little piece of foam or a pellet suspended up off the bottom, just sat there, and it can be absolutely deadly. So um, there's lots of little tricks within the waggler itself that can get you an edge. Really important to have your rod in a position where you can still be busy and feed, but you can pick it up, strike, tweak it, move which for me is across my right knee and my rest very slightly to my left. So I've got a little bit of give in the rod if one yanks it, but I'm also pretty tight to the float. So hopefully they'll look themselves if one does take it and tear off with it. And I'm just going to have a cast now without feeding where I just sit and hang it there. If you feel like there's an odd one in your peg that you're not catching, just not feeding for a few casts can often mug you one. Literally imagine them all hung up in the water having a look for the next bit of bait going in and then sort of a minute 90 seconds with nothing going in and your up bait's just there sometimes allows you to just nick one. There we go. Took a little bit of time. And that particular chuck, I sort of chucked in, got a little bit of line sank, then fed and then wound it right into the feed. And I think on these 
windy days, it's probably the way to go. It's very difficult to get good presentation on a waggler in a crosswind. You need that heavy flow and you need your line to be down. So the stereotypical sort of pellet waggler days of chucking it in and getting a bite as soon as it lands, probably not going to happen in conditions like this. And often it's like this on these big lakes. So having the knowledge in your armoury that you might have to fish a little bit different and feed a little bit different to catch in these conditions is important. I think this is just an F1, but the beautiful fish here in Loco. And it's the first one on the waggler. Went that little bit deeper as well. Oh, it's not, it's a big mirror. Just a little bit of a lazy one that weren't fighting. There we go. Again, a little bit of hard work and a few tweaks, but another big carp in the net. And I keep saying it, you don't need to catch 100 mile an hour to build up a weight, a proper carp like this. And that's what fishing on these big lakes is all about. Absolutely nailed middle of the top lip. Normally shows you've got the depth about right. Probably four and a half feet. Mirror, maybe five pound. I'm just going to try that again now. Cast in, sink the line a little bit, then feed in front of the float and bring it back into it. Takes you a little bit of time to actually get into a rhythm and a routine with this sort of fishing, so often you've got to fish it for a few minutes first, but I'm going to cast this well out into the lake, stop it and get a bit of line down. Now that waggler's actually miles past where my feed's going to go, but then I'm going to feed three times with like six or seven eight mil pellets and then tweak it back into it so everything sank and my line's down but my hook bait's now falling in and amongst them last few pellets and there you go definitely seems to be the way to go on these bigger lakes another one straight away I'm sure this one is an F1. It's just about thinking about the presentation and even in tough conditions like this, if them fish want to be up in the water and the waggler's the only way to catch them, you've got to be able to present it to them. An F1 this time. I'm not going to turn my nose up at them though. Look at them beautiful golden fish, aren't they, here in loco. Absolute stunners. Terminal tackle wise, it does take a lot of ammo when you're catching big fish like hopefully we will be today. And I tend to use two different up patterns, an MWG for a little bit more finesse work, normally to 017 or 019 engage. No messing about with light lines. There's a lot of pressure when fish bolt off on a bomb or you're striking into them on a waggler. And normally for me, it's a hair rigged bait band. I actually tie my own. Um, and on really good days, or if I feel like I'm not hooking fish properly, I'll switch to a super pellet waggler hook. Although I do like to tie my own, the ready rigs that are available with hair rigged bait bands, all ready and perfect for you to actually use are absolutely exceptional. So if you do struggle tying bait bands on a hair rig, we've got MWGs with bait bands and also super pellet wagglers. The pellet waggler ones in particular are very handy. They come at 24 inches long, so you can cut them down to literally whatever length you want. I think one thing that'll surprise a lot of people is the actual line that I've got on my reel for this fish, and it's actually one of our cheaper lines. It's drag line. Not only does it come on a massive bulk spool that's really handy, but it's just so versatile, you can sink it really well. It's almost like neutral buoyancy. So if you want to sink it, you can sink it and it goes down very quickly, which is important if you want to sink it in windy conditions, but it doesn't actually sink really deep. And if you want to leave it on the surface, you pretty much can. You can cast in and leave it. It's only four pound, but it's 020 in diameter. So thin enough to cast nice and easily. I can punch out a little foam waggler if I needed to with it, but ridiculously strong as well. And I think a strong thin line that you can either sink or leave on the surface is important with this kind of fishing on these big lakes because 
Some days you might want to sink your line. Some days you might want to leave it on the surface if you're getting quick bites. And of course, you need that durability factor for hooking big fish and catching big weights as well. So picking the right reel line for the job, definitely the one. I actually use this for my main line for a lot of big waggler and slider fishing as well. That's where I've got the confidence in it from. It's absolutely perfect for big lake waggler fishing. What you'll find is when you're actually winding into your feed, your bow always tends to go a little bit with the wind. So if you can cast slightly left, by the time you've actually tweaked your waggler back, you're actually pulling it slightly downwind and it just ends up in the perfect place in the middle of the feed. Just seen a fish top again. I think I'm going to get a bite again. Next couple of casts, pretty confident I'm going to get one. Oh, big carp just put his head out right in the feed. There's definitely odd one there. Won't be long. I'm definitely going to hook another few on this. I'm really confident. The fact that they're giving themselves away like that. Just presentations. Very tricky in this wind. That were a big fish that jumped out then. Can have a couple of casts again. Now I know that there's an odd one there because I've seen I'm just going to have a couple of casts without feeding. See if I can just nick one. Oh, Mr. Bite, first time we are feeding. Same again. Annoying that is because that could have been a big fish. I am going to feed the close line. It gives me a little opportunity to make sure I've got some bait in there. Very easy when you're seeing them big fish rolling to think that you've got a fish dead shallow to catch them but what you've got to think is when you've got five feet of line below your waggler on this sort of fishing you're actually fishing every little bit of water from as soon as that pellet hits the surface so if a carp wants to take it as it's falling at a foot deep you'll still get the bite but you're also giving yourself the option of exploring all the layers down to whatever depth you're actually at start to get an odd bite now on this feel like it's uh, it's gradually getting better and better and got a nice little technique of keeping my bait a little bit more stable now just missed two bites quite literally two bites in three or four casts which is annoying because they could be big carp there we go knew that we were going to get one then Missed a couple of bites. Odd indication, odd fish popping its head out. Just get a feeling that you're getting a little spell of bites and fish. Feels like a good one, this and all. Might notice as well, I've actually gone for a 12 foot Aventus for this on these big lakes. I just feel like if you've got to put that 10 gram bolsa on in these rough conditions like we've got here today, it just gives you that extra bit of length to really whack it out there, control your fish when you're playing and pick your line up and strike if you need to in rough conditions. No doubt this is another proper carp. And again, seems like I've had sort of eight or 10 minutes without catching anything, but look, another six, seven, maybe even eight pound fish in the net. And that is what these big lakes and these two methods are all about. Not going to lie, gang, you don't get conditions much trickier for your fishing a waggler, but when you get an odd bite because you've got it right, in, the, oh, in these sort of conditions, it's very, very satisfying. And you don't need loads of carp like this to soon build up a big weight. But it's getting a bit tricky. I'm hammering the six mil pellets in. I've consciously upped the feed a bit short and knowing that I want to have a little look on it with how awkward this waggler is to fish. So I'm going to get this one back and we'll have a little look on that closer line, see if we can nick a little runner fish on that now. But I'm still going to keep pinging an odd eight mile out there because I won't mind catching a few more of your bigger brothers and sisters, mate. Right, so I've been priming this close in line. Before I go on it, I'm going to put three 
nice dollops of six mils in and then hook bait wise I've just gone for a plain six mil um, fishery pellet to kick off with and just like that longer one I'm just going to try and keep everything nice tight tidy I'm hoping that we get a good runner F1s on this but it wouldn't surprise me with the amount of carp that we've hooked and seen out long if we catch an odd carp as well especially now we're a little bit later on and same same bomb and everything I'm just going to try and be as accurate as possible and literally just ping it on top of where I've been putting them pellets started on that 15 inch up length just straightened it out as it's got to the bottom and that's right in amongst that feed now everything the same as out there but just closer range and move that rest up a bit having messed it up a bit for shoot waggler and i'm not going to stop feeding that longer line either because if i can get a runner fish on this nip back out long and nick an odd one on either bomb or waggler out there that'd be great especially later on might be able to just pop out on the waggler if that wind drops or i get a little window of opportunity and nick a couple more big ones. A lot of people ask the question, do you ever clip up on this kind of method? And I've got to be honest, I don't when I'm fishing a bomber. I really try and practice and concentrate to be accurate. And what I mean by that is being able to fire some pellets in, make a real conscious note of where they're going in, and then learn to flick your bomb in and feather it in so it's landing right in amongst or just on the back edge of where that feed's going. If anything, if you're in doubt, I'd rather be fishing just past or just on the back edge, ideally right in amongst them. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but the more you can get out there and do it, the better you'll get at it for sure. Just started to get an odd indication on this now. There's definitely an odd one there. I've got to be honest, I thought that we'd drop in and catch quite well straight away, having fed it for so long. So it kind of tells me there's probably not that many fish gathered there. Maybe I've been a little bit positive um, with the feed on this line, getting a bit excited having caught quite a few fish out there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ease back a little bit with the feed on it. We keep pinging an odd eight mil out on that longer line so I can have another chuck out for a carp if needs be and just almost try and let any fish that are on this closer line clear the bottom up a little bit. I've been feeding quite aggressively with them sixes and I'm thinking now maybe I'm just easing it back and feeding a dozen or 15 pellets, not quite as often. Just to see if I can almost starve a few into a bit of competition you're going to be busy with this kind of fishing you're going to be feeding all the time you're going to be swapping between rods you're going to be casting quite regular so having everything to hand neat tidy and having your set up so you can be efficient like that is really important you need your bait nice and close to you your catty close to your landing net and everything neat and tidy so that you can be as busy and efficient as possible without worrying about it but definitely not happening on this close line, folks. I don't know if it's because there's not any number of fish close in at this end of the lake. I've had an odd indication. There's definitely an odd fish there, but if anything, I've probably been a little bit too aggressive with the bait. Looking back now, got a little bit giddy having caught a few out there and stepped it up a little bit too soon. Um, however, I have been keeping that longer line fed four or five eight mils all the time so I'm thinking I'm gonna get off this get back out there and try and nick a few more big fish and hold back on the feed a little bit on this closer line just let them clear it out a little bit and then maybe later on I could drop back on it and get a run if not if it's good out there I can stay back out there picking off them bigger carp but definitely a bit steady I'm going to get off it, get back out where I was catching an odd fish and just ease back on the feed a little bit. And I absolutely loved catching them on that waggler. I wouldn't mind catching a couple more on it. 
build me rest. Back on the eight mils. Still at that bit deeper depth of like five feet. 10 gram waggler in the wind and an eight mil pellet. And hopefully, because I've given this a little rest, there'll be a few out there waiting for us. Definitely find on these big lakes that resting a line and keeping feeding it while you're doing something else normally allows a few fish to gather like that. Literally straight back out on the waggler, been feeding it and got one immediately. Absolutely love carp fishing on rod and line. I do. It's one of the most enjoyable kinds of fishing. If I had to go pleasure fishing somewhere on a commercial, it'd be big carp on a waggler like this. It's been a cracker to be honest, folks. I mean, the short line's never kicked in, but the beginning, absolutely perfect, nicking them early carp on the bomb, then a change to that waggler and figuring out how to actually catch them on it. The importance of keeping that float still out in the lake in poor conditions and even the fact that we came onto that close line and sort of gave this a good rest and then we've gone back on it and had a blistering finish it's been fantastic i've loved it i'd absolutely love to come and fish a few more matches on these lakes in the near future finding that right depth on the waggler has been important and then obviously the fact we've talked a lot about the tackle that we've used and as you can see when you're catching big powerful fish like this really having to punch it out there to get the distance having the confidence that you've got that right kit on it's all mega important what a stunner look at that another loco mirror if you've not done any sort of this big lake rod and line fishing for carp folks make sure this spring or summer you get out there and have a little tickle on it because i can promise you you'll absolutely love it i'm just going to hold this one up for you because she's an absolute cracker to finish on there you go hope you enjoyed that one Get on the bomb, get on the pellet waggler, find yourself some big commercials full of big fish and you'll have a fantastic time. <laughs>